Secrets of the High Set, the math section. This video is both for adult education teachers and for students. It is not a video on how to do any particular kind of math, but rather is about the test itself, how it's put together, what kind of questions there are, and tips and tricks for handling the different kinds of questions. This first part is just going to look at the structure of the test, and we'll start that right now. Okay, so there's basically four types of problems on the high set math. The first category of problem is numbers and operations. And that's the stuff that's just like sort of straightforward word problems. You don't need algebra to solve, uh, percent discount, uh, calculating the unit rate of something, like if you know how much it is per pound, can you calculate how much it is per ounce, that sort of thing. The next section is probability and data analysis. Probability is kept at a very simple level, just something like what are the odds of rolling a six-sided die and getting a two or less. So it's just basically fractions. It gets a little bit harder than that, but not too much. Data analysis is reading graphs, charts, that sort of thing. And also, can you find the average of things? Can you find the mean, median, and mode? Mean being average and median and mode being the other two that you see in this category. I've seen it said in their uh, literature on the test that you also need to know standard deviation. I've not seen that show up on any practice tests, however. That's all I have to go on. Geometry and measurement. Geometry is pretty straightforward. Uh, circles, triangles, squares, rectangles, those are going to be the most popular shapes. Uh, every now and then there'll be a volume problem where you've got to figure out the volume of a three-dimensional shape. Uh, the hardest I've seen is a cylinder. I haven't seen like a cone or uh, asking for the volume of a pyramid, even though those formulas are given to you at the beginning of the test. Measurement is not just measuring things with inches or centimeters. It's also measuring things like elapsed time, maybe converting pounds to ounces or converting uh, minutes to seconds, things like that. And finally, algebraic concepts. And as you're going to see, this actually, this category makes up the bulk of the test compared to the other sections, but you do not need to panic. And I'll explain why, even if your algebra is very weak, this should not be uh, too worrying to you. Okay, this comes directly from a PDF you can get on the ETS website for the high set. And I just wanted to show you basically this right here, also in this handy pie chart. In fact, if we look at the pie chart, you'll see one big chunk. That, of course, is four algebraic concepts you see that the other three categories, numbers and operations, measurement, geometry, data analysis, probability, and statistics, have almost the exact same percentage. Now this percentage is gonna vary a little bit from test to test. These are the approximate percentages. And I was able to use these percentages and score reports from people who had scored exactly an eight to sort of backwards engineer how many questions you need to get right on the test. I'll give you that number in just a second. Uh, they used to just actually tell you how many you got right on the test and then they thought they would try to keep that secret. These are math teachers. It's not that hard to calculate. I'm not sure why they're trying to keep that secret. Uh, we actually asked a guy at a meeting who works at ETS, how many do you have to get right to pass the math? He said, I can't tell you that. In any event, uh, like I said, don't worry too much about the fact that most of it is algebra. When you see how many you need to get right, even if you get no algebra questions right, you can still pass the test. All right, I'd love to teach a very comprehensive, in-depth, problem-solving approach to math. Don't have that kind of time. If, you teach, if you're a teacher of adult education, you know what I'm talking about. You often do not have long with the students. They've got commitments, jobs, kids, sick relatives they're taking care of, transportation issues, and all of those things make it difficult for them to really come day after day after day to learn math at the level we would like. So our job is to coach them through, get them enough math to pass the test, and we can do that fairly easily. Now, here's how the test works. There's 50 questions, of course, but you don't get a score of 1 to 50. You get a score of 1 to 20. 
Each test for most of the sections kind of varies in terms of how many you need to get right to get an eight because an eight is a passing score on uh, an individual section. A little bit more to it, you've got a cumulative score you've got to get, but you need to get an eight on a math section to pass it. So again, that doesn't mean you got eight right. In fact, what it has almost every single time I've checked on the test for the past few years, it's meant getting about 14 right out of the 50 questions, 14 out of 50, and that's been fairly consistent. I don't see the test, but I see the, the score reports. And every single one, when I use percentages that they offer to sort of figure out how many someone who scored an eight got right, 14 is a number I came up with. This is very, very good news. Why is this good news? Well, let's do a little probability. If you're a student, this will be a probability review. But think about it. If you've got 50 questions, now each one of these questions has five answer choices. So unless you're psychic or unusually unlucky, randomly guessing should get you about a fifth of those right. And one fifth of 50 is 10. That's right. If you randomly guess, you're only four away from getting uh, an eight, a passing score on the test. So one thing I like to tell my students is that you are responsible for finding five or so questions that you know you can do and to really spend the time to work them thoroughly and check them carefully. Now, we don't want to shoot for a 14 or a 15. We want to shoot higher than that, obviously. But the biggest problem I see with students is they are intimidated by the test. The, the questions are not in order of difficulty. The second question on the whole test could be the hardest one there is on that test and people begin to shut down. They begin to doubt themselves when later questions might be perfectly within their ability level. So your job or what you tell a student their job is, is to hunt for points. That's it. Don't worry about the ones you can't do. Don't leave any blank. You're going to guess on every single question. And as we're going to see in future videos, a lot of times you can eliminate answer choices, even if you're not sure how to do the math exactly, and improve your odds even better of guessing right. Okay, it's not exactly what they want you to do, but it's how you pass a test. So, thinking about those percentages and why I said not to panic, even if algebra is a complete mystery to you or to the student you're working with, is because remember the other percentages. We had 19% for numbers and operations, 18% for uh, the data analysis, probability, and we had 18% of the questions were uh, involving geometry and measurement. Well, if you add all that up, that's more than half the test. And yet, if you take the idea of only needing to get 14 right, guess what? 14 out of 50 is 28%. So as you can see, it's extremely possible to pass the test without knowing one single bit of algebra. Hey, I don't like it either. I don't want to send people to college unprepared, but a lot of people have other goals. And in our program, we do try to make ourselves available to help move into college math if that is the path they're taking. But if they're just taking it so that they can go and get that certificate that doesn't involve math to become a welder or a phlebotomist or something like that, uh, we want to get them past the test quickly and so paying attention to the basic math they, they already have an idea of is, in fact, a perfectly valid way to coach the test. Okay, I spent all that time going over the structure of the test because it's actually quite different from the other four sections of the high set in that you only need to get that 14 or so to pass the test. So. The first tip here is don't let the test intimidate you. You may, and in fact, probably will see problems on the test that you don't know how to do. And if you're the teacher working with a student, explain that to them. 
that that doesn't mean they're going to fail. Even if they know they've missed a bunch, they only need to get about a third right. So don't let the test intimidate you into thinking that you cannot pass and that you're not doing well. Tip number two, hunt for points. The reason the test is not going to intimidate you or your student any longer is because they know they can hunt for points. They can go and look for those problems that they know how to do, that are familiar, that involve more basic math, and they can skip the ones they don't know how to do, even if it's not algebra. Let's say uh, they tried to learn area of a circle just before the test. They really never caught on to it. They see an area of a circle problem and they're just gonna skip that one. They're gonna go find the ones they know how to do. So this is sort of counterintuitive, but number three, if you understand the question, slow down and make sure you get it right. That's right, I want you to go slow on the easy questions and I want you to go fast on the hard questions. If you waste time on the hard questions, you won't have time to be careful on the easy questions. So if you get one that you feel you know how to do, slow down, read the question a couple of times, and really, step by step, write down the information and make sure you get this question right. You can't afford to miss the ones that you know how to do. Number four may, may seem obvious, but it is absolutely critical. Four, check your answers. Uh, I, I cannot even estimate what percentage of students I've had who did not pass the first time specifically because they rushed, tried to do all of the problems, and did not check the answers on the ones that they had a reasonable shot at getting right. Now I tell my students to answer two questions to themselves when they're finished with a problem as a way to check to see if their answer seems right. First, did I answer the right question, especially if the word problem, the text, is a little bit long, has more than one sentence? Make sure you answer the right question. That's usually the last thing in uh, the little paragraph is the actual question. For example, let's say it's a question about a sweater that is 20% off, and you're all excited because you know how to do percentages. Maybe you even know how to do percent discount. And so you go through the problem and you say, fantastic, I know how much the sweater is gonna cost after the sale. Lo and behold, that answer's in the answer choice and you pick it. And yet it turns out that was not the actual question they were asking. They asked instead, how much would you save? It's basically the same math, but it's a different question. And you really cannot afford to have the right answer to the wrong question because that's not gonna count. So make sure you answer the right question. The next question to ask yourself when checking your answer, does my answer make sense? Uh, for some reason, students who are very intelligent will sometimes turn off their common sense when they get into the testing room. You cannot do this. What will happen is a student will see a a question that's similar to one they've done before. They'll try to remember the exact steps they did on that question they'd seen before, and then they'll pick the answer they get that way without once stopping to say, wait a second, does this even make sense? For example, let's take that sweater that was on sale. Uh, one thing you know for sure is that a sale price is gonna be lower than the original price. Otherwise, who's gonna come to your sale to pay more? And there will be answer choices a lot of times that represent things like, a sale price that's higher than the original amount. And if you messed up the problem, if you confused the steps, if you thought you were supposed to add at the end rather than subtract, looking to see if your answer makes sense is a way to spot a potential mistake. So don't turn off that common sense. You know that people don't ride bicycles at 500 miles an hour. You know that a car is not 50 feet long. You know that uh, when you go to the zoo, you're not gonna see three and one-fourth giraffes sitting in a display or find two and one-third cars in a parking lot. These are all answers that don't make any sense no matter what math the problem is asking you to do. In fact, sometimes you can simply eliminate answer choices, even if you don't know how to do the math but understand what they're asking just by crossing off the ones that don't make sense. 
If you'll do those two things, you will eliminate those one or two questions you get wrong that'll take you from a seven to an eight. Uh, really, if this is the only thing I could tell people, this is what I would emphasize. This last is among the techniques that I caution people is a most of the time it works technique. Um, and here's what I mean. If you're working on a problem, now it's one of those what I would call a self-contained problem. It's not one of those problems where you're given a bunch of information and it asks you several different math problems based on that information. This technique will not work. But if it's one of those questions where you're given a little bit of information and one question about it, you can ask yourself at the end, did I use all the numbers mentioned in the problem? Now again, I only have access to the practice tests. I'm not allowed to look at the real tests. And uh, so I can say though that on the practice tests, every single problem I have seen that fits that description, in order to solve the problem, you needed to use every number mentioned in the problem. So let's say, I'm not even gonna give you the actual words, but there's a problem and you see there's a 30%. There's another, there's another number, 90, and then further down there's a 15%. All right, so you do some math with the 30% and the 90, you find your answer in the answer choice, you get all excited, but you've got to go back and ask yourself, wait a second, I didn't use this 15%, and odds are pretty good that uh, you've left out a step. So if you'll do these three things to check your answers, if you'll hunt for points, if you don't let yourself get intimidated by the test, and if you slow down on the questions that you really feel you've got a shot at, uh, you can pass this test. And we're gonna have some videos with some specific techniques on different types of questions coming up. But if all you had time before the test was to watch this, this may be enough to get you through.